ladies and gentlemen, I think if we take the average between the two clocks, it's 10 o'clock. Um, so welcome to uh, today's uh, Housing and uh, community, uh, Communities Committee uh, meeting. Um, I'd like to uh, welcome uh, new members to, to the committee, uh, Councillor uh, Richard Waters, who replaces uh, Councillor uh, Beth Pover. Uh, and I'd also like to record my uh, thanks to Councillor Pover for her uh, contribution and her uh, work on the committee over the, the, the past uh, 18, 18 months. Um, before moving to the uh, items of business uh, on our agenda today, um, I wanted to uh, pay tribute to uh, Liz Dewar, who sadly died last month uh, following a diagnosis of an aggressive uh, form of leukemia. Um, Liz will be remembered by officers and colleagues uh, as an active tenant and residence representative uh, and a, a wise council. Uh, staff members, particularly those in the Letham office, uh, have told me how greatly they will uh, miss her. I, I wasn't able to attend uh, Liz's funeral uh, last month, but it was a bright, colourful occasion, uh, and I wouldn't want her passing uh, to go unmentioned and would want this committee's sadness and loss uh, to be recorded. Uh, can I have your agreement for that? Thank you. Um, under uh, item uh, one, apologies and uh, substitutions, uh, I have details of uh, Councillor uh, Wilson substituting for Councillor Coates and uh, Councillor Baird substituting for Councillor Shires. Um, I've also got uh, apologies from uh, Councillor uh, Crawford Reed, uh, but no substitution. So, uh, are there any other uh, substitutions or apologies to, to note? Thank you. Right. Uh, can I have your approval uh, for the minutes of the meeting of the Housing and Communities Committee of the 16th of May uh, and for me to sign them? Agreed? Um, are there any declarations of interest from elected members with regard to any item on the agenda? No? Okay, thank you for that. Um, can I ask for the committee's agreement to follow our established uh, custom and practice to vary the uh, agenda to take the private items at the start of the agenda, those being the uh, police and fire and rescue service operational updates, which will then enable uh, colleagues to return to operations at the earliest possibility time. Um, on resuming in uh, public session, we would then move to the, uh, the, the uh, public uh, police and fire uh, performance uh, updates. I have been um, advised by the police that they don't have uh, any uh, private operational update to make and that the fire service say that theirs should be quick. So um, we should be able to resume in, uh, very sh in public in very short order, um, hopefully within sort of five, ten minutes sort of time. So um, if I could ask for um, the members of the public and the, the press to uh, leave the uh, chamber for the duration of the private session, we'll hope to see you back uh, very shortly. Thank you. Okay, we'll now resume in a public session with paper 5.1, which is the 2018 uh, first quarter performance report from the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. Um, highlights of the report show that the accidental dwelling fires uh, at 22 are the lowest for four years uh, with fatal accidental dwelling fire casualties at zero uh, and non-fatal casualties at two following, falling steadily uh, for the past three years. Uh, there were 12 fires in non-domestic properties representing the lowest number of fires for the last four years uh, with no fatal or non-fatal fire casualties. Um, can I invite uh, Local Senior Officer Gordon Pride again uh, to speak to the report. Thank you, Gordon. Thank you very much. Uh, prior to uh, asking members to note scrutinise and question the report, there are a couple of elements I'd just like to highlight. Uh, moving through the report, and this is where I hope I've managed to get the page numbers to correlate from my report to the papers you have I think it's on page 24, the performance summary. Uh, what we have is an overview of the performance summary to date. We see from the 12 uh, headline indicators that seven are in the posit positive, three are slightly negative, uh, less than 10%, and 
and two are over 10% of target. Uh, what I'll do is, we'll, as I go through the paper, we'll go through some of these in more detail and take questions towards them at the end. Moving on to page 25, we have an overview for uh, members to, to summarise the paper and identify some of the, the key elements. If I could then proceed to page 26 and 27, that is improving fire safety in the home, focusing on accidental dwelling fires. As the, the convener uh, mentioned at the start, there's a very positive uh, news story around this element. The, the fires are down, as are the casualties, which is, as I said, very positive. We will continue to, to try and drive these as low as possible, and the mechanism we do that is mostly through our home fire safety visits. We carried out 345 home fire safety visits this year. But also, we'll do this through the, the great partnership work that happens throughout uh, Perth and Kinross. I was at a recent launch yesterday uh, of further partnership working with the, the mobile library. So this positive uh, uh, process in, in Perth, Perth and Kinross can only be applauded and we'll continue to support this as a, an active partner and I'm sure we'll benefit from this partnership working. Moving on to uh, pages 28 and 29, looking at our uh, non-domestic fires. Again, as the convener uh, identified, these are again very positive results. What we have done is we've completed 75 uh, audits uh, by our fire safety enforcement team. Uh, we've got a dedicated team of fire safety enforcement audits that uh, go out um, and visit premises and go through their fire risk assessments to make sure they're suitable and sufficient. We'll also support businesses in the area uh, giving advice to make sure that uh, these public buildings uh, remain safe for members of Perth and Kinross at all times. Moving on to uh, the next two pages, page 30 and 31. Here we see the, the number of uh, road traffic collisions. And again, just to uh, make members aware, what we report on is the road traffic collisions that we've attended. This is not the full picture, but those stats are held and are worked on in partnership. Uh, so we are aware of the overall picture as well. The front instance we attended, we attended 22, and that was round about the, the average for uh, quarter one, and we are on target to meet our, uh, or be below our annual target of attending 89 uh, road traffic collisions. And again, coming through, we see a slight rise in the number of casualties and fatalities, which is obviously very sad to report on. These were caused through a number of incidents, but one incident uh, accounted for seven casualties and one fatality, which is probably one of the reasons, one tragic incident, uh, which is probably the reason why the numbers are slightly high. But again, we will continue to work in partnership with uh, our partners, police, council and others to try and work to drive these down as best and as quickly as we can. Moving further on to page uh, 32 and 33, we're looking at our unwanted fire alarm signals, our refund signals. These are again slightly higher than we would like, slightly uh, above the three-year average, and also uh, we're slightly above uh, our plan to meet our annual target. I've been working in this area for six months now, and we've undertaken a review of our unwanted fire alarm strategy recently. Uh, the current strategy wasn't delivering the improvements we'd, we'd all been looking for. So a number of elements we, are look, we have adopted is we've identified for the Tayside area two new UFAS champions. They are much lower in the, the, the structure and that allows them to be much more operationally focused and hopefully much more engaging with partners. We've also engaged at that same level two uh, 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 predetermined attendance reduction uh, champions. So these will work with premises to try and uh, drive the number of blue light journeys down for us as well. And in addition, uh, our assistant chief officer has written, because this is not just a Perth and Kinross or a Tayside issue, this, these numbers are being reflected nationally. Our assistant chief officer, David McGowan, who leads the prevention and protection department uh, nationally, has written to the chief exec of both the uh, local authorities and the NHS boards to see if they can work with us to drive this down further. There is continued work ongoing, an example being we have a two year, two, twice yearly meeting with NHS to work with them, work with their estates department to drive elements down, and we are targeting a number of these premises through our, our current procedures to drive these down. Moving on, looking at our deliberate fires, 
our deliberate fires, uh, the primary fires are down slightly, which is positive to report on, but our secondary fires, they remain slightly higher than we would like. And again, we'll be working and targeting these for a multi-agency response. The majority of these fires happen round Perth, Perth city centre, uh, Perth North and Perth South. So we will target our activities around there, we will target our in interventions, and again, we'll work in partnerships uh, just to make sure we, we work with educate and support uh, with communities to minimise these as we go forward. Really from there, I've covered the majority of activity. There's just two or three elements through the community safety engagement programmes that I'd like to highlight. We've got a number of uh, campaigns ongoing. I was fortunate enough to uh, visit Safety Siders this year. I think it was coordinated by the police, but supported by all agencies. Very positive, very enjoyable uh, day, and a, a lot of children were able to go through that during that period. We can see a number of elements. I was also able to attend the Animal Life Saving Equipment Smoky Paws project. This has been, uh, this is a charity, uh, and it was funded by uh, local members of the community. The they were able to support the, 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 pit, the pit lottery and that, that sort of area around that, that tertiary area with, uh, I think it was six sets. They were delivered by the, the lead, Glen Ewing, from the, the Scottish lead. And th this now means we have uh, six additional appliances that uh, have the ability to give oxygen for the pets that are involved in the fires as well. So that adds that additional support where that uh, becomes a priority. And I know uh, Gary West uh, is continuing to raise money and his aim is to get them throughout uh, Perth and Kinross and also throughout Tayside. So he's continuing that work and we're looking to support it. And there are a number of uh, other elements there for the members to look at. And if I move on to Appendix 2, uh, a couple of notable uh, incident and events. Uh, probably the one I'd like to identify is Exercise Mayflower. It happened on the 3rd of May. It was quite a chilly evening, but it was a very successful multi-agency exercise. Uh, we were able to be part of a, a multi-agency response to a, an incident on the river and it allowed us to test our partnership work and test our response both as a fire and rescue service and as a partnership to ensure we would be able to respond to an incident on the river. So without going into any more detail around these elements, I'm more than happy to take any questions from here. Thank you. Um, thanks very much for that, uh, Mr. Pride. I think it's, uh, the, the committee will welcome uh, the, the initiative uh, on uh, unwanted fire alarm uh, signals. Uh, it's certainly been an issue that the, the, that the committee has considered and been concerned about in the, in the past, so we hope that initiative of uh, UFIS champions bears, bears fruit and we look forward to uh, seeing how that uh, progresses. I think the director also wanted to uh, comment on the issue of, of UFIS before we open for questions. Okay, thank you, convener. Yes, I mean, we can confirm that the chief executive did get a letter from Mr. Dildon that John Handling, who's our um, health, safety and wellbeing manager, will then liaise with Scottish Fire and Rescue Service to see how you know, sort of we can work together um, to tackle the issue. Thank you very much. Councillor Drysdale. Thank you, convener. Um, I wanted to just focus briefly on um, the, the issue of uh, road traffic collision casualties, fatal and non-fatal. Um, I think we've spoken about this before uh, in previous meetings. Uh, and the, I mean, the, the issue here for me is that, okay, there are, uh, this it's described as targets, um, but clearly the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service has no way of um, influencing directly uh, casualties uh, and the numbers thereof. So to what extent is this an appropriate um, measure of the effectiveness of your service? There are obviously uh, challenges in how we can have a, a significant impact on this, but this is one of the uh, key risks within Perth and Kinross, and as a community planning partner within Perth and Kinross, it's something we want to focus our activity on. What we can support is through educational elements, what we can support is through the uh, multi-agency approach, through a, a road safety group that we are working with, both in PCAD and throughout Tayside. Uh, we do educational work through schools, and we understand we are a, a very small part in the overall solution to that, but we are happy to uh, be held to account as part of a partnership, and uh, we'll continue to support that until we get it driven down to as low a practicable level. Uh, 
Uh, yeah. Um, okay. Thank you very, very much uh, for that. Um, the, the, the numbers of casualties being reported, uh, you know, uh, are um, improved uh, uh, in, in that there are fewer overall um, uh, casualties. However, what, I, what I'd be interested to understand is, and I don't know how, how you can comment because, uh, as you say, this is only a part of your a part of the overall uh, number of accidents within Perth and Kinross, but. Um, to what extent are, are the injuries and the casualties um, drivers and passengers of um, vehicles and to what extent are they um, either pedestrians or cyclists or, or those in non-protected vehicles? What, again, going back to my health warning at the start almost, what we, the, the road traffic collisions we get invited to by partners, they tend to come in through the ambulance service and through the police. We will respond to incidents where people uh, require extrication. So we would have a higher percentage of people from within the vehicle uh, because we go there to remove them from that vehicle to support the, the ambulance service that way. If it was a pedestrian or if it was a motorcyclist or if it was a, a pedestrian, oh sorry, a pedestrian cyclist, a, a, a bicyclist, we would probably not be invited because there wouldn't be that extrication need uh, and the ambulance service would be the key issue in removing them. So we would have a probably a, a, a much higher percentage of people from within a vehicle than would be a true reflection of Perth and Kinross. Gordon, I think it's also worth mentioning that the, um, the fire service chair the, 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 the local road safety review group uh, and are you know, actively involved in the development of the revised road street safety strategy, um, which will come to the appropriate committees uh, in due course. Um, I think the director wanted to, 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 to comment on, on uh, road safety as well in response to your questions, Eric. Uh, thank you, con convener. Um, I'm hoping that both Gordon and, and Graham will be able to confirm that there are no actual accident black spots within Perth and Kinross, you know, sort of, and I think that that's, I'm just, you know, sort of looking for a nod, I think, yes. Um, so I think that that's an important bit to, you know, sort of to, to consider that, you know, sort of we look at every accident in conjunction with our partners to ensure that there is nothing that we cannot do in terms of the, the safety of the actual road layout, you know, sort of uh, anyway, that there is nothing, I mean, nothing that, that gives us cause for concern that there is a particular area where there are a number of incidents, um, you know, sort of, but, you know, sort of as the report um, says that we are refreshing the road safety partnership, you know, sort of we are aware that there are issues, you know, sort of around education, um, you know, sort of, and, you know, sort of in response to um, Eric and the convener says that they will be bringing forward, you know, those, those, um, that, that paper in due course. Councillor McEwen. Thank you. Uh, I was going to ask about the unwanted fire alarms and given what you've said yourself and what the executive director has said, Looking at the stats and how they're presented to us, our benchmark, the red line on our graph, seems to be a three-year average. Well, come next year, that three-year average will look pretty decent because realistically our benchmark is 15, 16, and we're looking at about 100 false alarms in the quarter. So could I request that going forward that we keep that graph expanding rather than shifting, if you know what I mean, so that we actually still try to aim for that original 100 incidents rather than the new benchmark will shift to 150 by, by sheer statistical. What, uh, certainly what we've done this year uh, is to, if there has been, as I mentioned in the closed session, if there has been any target that will have gone up because of a statistical anomaly like that, we have maintained the, the previous target to make sure that just because of a, a more challenging year, we don't uh, increase the target. So we've kept it that way. The, my concern about keeping the graphs at that size will then give you much more information in the, the, the sort of in three, four, five years time, the, the, the documentation will be quite large. We are happy to continue to supply whatever information you wish though. And we can happily work with the chair at pre-agenda to make sure we get the, the report to the structure that uh, the committee require. And also if this, is required, we'd be happy to bring either an annual uh, report on UFAS or a specific report on UFAS as and when you wish to, keep you, to give you more details uh, at any point you require. I suppose what I'm asking is that the red line stays where it is. 
and it isn't recalculated, even though you can keep the graph the same size and shift it, let's actually keep that red line in the same place. I, I appreciate that that's what you're asking uh, for, Councillor McEwen. I'm not entirely convinced that that's a, 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 a really helpful suggestion. Um, I think my attitude towards targets is that they should always be smart um, uh, and they should be you know, achievable and realistic. Um, and and uh, I think if we've got a three-year um, trend of you know, UFAS, or UFAS at, at around about the 150 mark, um, trying to uh, maintain a, a target of a, a 104 uh, may, may not be, be realistic, and I would rather that we were uh, trying to uh, d you know, develop targets which were achievable, achieving a, a, a downward trend. I think when you look at the um, rest of the, um, the Scottish Fire and Rescue Performance Report, you can see that the targets you know, have been stretched uh, and have been consistent. Um, and just because something was a certain way four years ago, I don't think necessarily um, in, in, informs you know the performance four years four years later. So um, I think if we were to uh, if we were to uh, you know look, look at setting different targets or setting targets in a different way, we would want to do that in an informed manner with the um, the information that the the, the local senior officer uh, is is offering to pr provide. So. Um, I wouldn't like to agree that we do that today, um, but I'm perfectly happy that we take a closer look at, at UFIS and, 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 and see whether uh, we would want to change the target setting approach uh, in, in the future. Um, plus, these are also um, the Scottish Fire and Rescue uh, Service targets, which they set, although they do consult us uh, on, the, on, on those targets. So, are you happy with uh, that as a means forward? I think we can discuss it privately okay. ourselves. Yeah. Okay, good. Councillor Hearn. Thank you very much. Uh, this is probably a joint question with yourself and the police, but uh, with regards to the deliberate secondary fires, a large number of secondary fires um, I know have been caused in the wooded area opposite the grammar school. And I just wondered how successful you are in identifying the individuals, as it appears to be a repeat group carrying out some of these fires. I personally don't have the details if we have actually targeted the exact group, but I know we've been targeting a lot of our community education around those specific areas, around those specific schools and around those uh, areas to make sure we get that right information. Uh, what I can do is I can check with my community safety team to find out if we have targeted the exact people. But I can offer reassurance if we do identify the exact people, we'll work in partnership with our uh, police and other colleagues to to target, educate and support them. We were also, we have a number of uh, sort of fire setter uh, techniques we can use with them. So depending on the individuals, when they're allocated, we can offer individual bespoke uh, packages for each and every one if, if that is appropriate. Thanks. Before I, I go into Councillor Wilson, can I say that although the screen behind me isn't working, we are still being recorded, so um, you might want to bear that in mind. Uh, Councillor Wilson. Thanks, convener. Um, I was interested in the number of fire safety visits that are still continuing and obviously commend that. Is there a targeting strategy for the visits on risk assessment or vulnerability? What we have is a, a risk rating profile for every premise and we will do that uh, prior to going and then we'll do an after the visit to see first of all if we are targeting the right premise and then secondly if we've made a significant improvement. Uh, what we've what traditionally we used to do is we used to target a broad range and try to go to contact as many people as possible. Nationally, we've moved away from that and we're becoming very much more focused on the most vulnerable. And we're trying to work to target our visits towards the most vulnerable. That's where it's very important. We get support from partners, we get support, and we do get very good support in this area, but get the right referrals from partners, get the right uh, contacts to make sure the list of people that wish a home fire safety are the, the, the people that need it and not what used to be the very much the worried well, the people who just wanted that confirmation that their house was as safe as they thought it was. So we are continuing to improve on that and we are continuing to try and increase our percentage of uh, vulnerable people that we uh, visit. We report on a points-based system and that points-based system is high, medium and low from vulnerability and that allows me to map how we're getting on. So we report in three three bands and I get that report ten or fifteen for the whole of Heath Fire, for the whole of Kirk and Kinross, for every station and for every watch to see who's delivering what to make sure we're targeting the right place. 
We've also instigated a, a review of our referral pathways just to make sure they are efficient and effective and we'll continue to support those that are effective and those that maybe aren't as effective we'll work with them to try and improve them and make sure they are targeted in the right people. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor McCall. Thank you, Convener. I'm very pleased to see that we are trying to most of those statistics and measures are in the right direction. But, and I may have asked this question in the last quarterly report about the uh, BFAS, but um, I seem to recall that a number of these uh, fire alarms accidentally were set off because of equipment failure or something went quite wrong rather than deliberately setting off fire alarms. And I'm just wondering if there's any statistics around particular makes or models of fire alarm systems or indeed uh, repeat offenders, to use the word loosely, um, in terms of facilities or locations where the fire alarm goes off persistently. What we do is for every time we attend a false alarm, our operational crews uh, implement a, a wooded fire alarm signal policy, which is a national policy. They should be recording information, they should be engaging with the occupier and see if there's any initial uh, actions that they can be taken. A lot of these are elements that can be quite easily resolved. A lot of it's down to maintenance, a lot of it's down to uses uh, that happen. Things like cleaning materials, things like uh, aerosols set them off as well. Uh, so there's a number of, sorry, you're fine. There's a number of quick, easy fixes uh, that can be done. If there are any repeat offenders to our unwanted fire alarm signal uh, processes, we have uh, some thresholds where if there are five in a three month period, 10 in a six month period or 20 in a nine month period at an individual premise, our fire safety enforcement officer will engage with them, go down and give uh, additional information. What we find is in the main, the companies and the buildings that have these issues are trying to resolve it as well. Uh, there was a bit of work done a number of years ago and the cost, there is a cost obviously to the fire and rescue service to attend, but the cost for the fire and rescue services to attend is about one tenth of the cost of the business emptying on average due to loss of productivity and other elements. So it's a win-win for all parties for us to come to work with us. So we try to work uh, in a positive <coughs> way with these companies. One of the best ways to resolve it is for them to invest in their fire alarm systems. But uh, obviously not every company has that spare capital at this point to invest. A lot of them do it by changing the, the detection heads to much more targeted detection heads, multi-sensor heads, which don't go off as easily and as quickly but are still of the, the right protection, but it do may come with a cost. So we often target those heads at the areas of highest uh, use, and then they are continually upgrading them. So we find in general a very positive response, and we do engage with the companies as, as best as we can. Follow-up question, Gemma? I, I suppose I was quite curious, um, really, about the fire alarm equipment suppliers themselves, or, or the makes or models. I mean, there was any of those that were, were more <coughs> prevalent to be m sensitive to accidental, accidentally being set off, and, and if so, then perhaps we also need to engage somehow, perhaps the the environment service, um, the housing community service, with the actual manufacturers as well, because very often individual incidents going forward to a supplier may not seem like very much, but if there's a collective issue with statistics being gathered around frequency, um, then that might have a different type of approach to resolve those. Certainly what we will do, we will look at Perth and Kinross and I've got the, f the figures for the whole Tayside area and if there are any specific issues we want to target or need to target, we'll target them. What we also do is have the ability through the National Fire and Rescue Service, we feed all our information in and the directorate, the t uh, Prevention and Protection Directorate will identify if there are any trends that when they bring the small number in, Perth and Kinross, Glasgow, Edinburgh, Stirling, whatever together, and if there is any specific trends they identify, they will then engage with a national body. Uh, but we have good, strong support from both local authority and from the majority of companies out there. If there are issues, we're able to address them and, and challenge them rightly. Okay, are there any other questions? Councillor Braun. Good morning, Mr. Bride. Um, just, just a couple of things, really. First of all, obviously, a rural, rural constituency, um, volunteer firefighters are the main uh, main sources of, of, of help. Uh, are we fully recruited on volunteer service and retained? 
And yeah. there's been a couple of retirees in the area, obviously. We continually recruit. There yeah. are certain areas that have some challenges. Uh, other areas where we have uh, almost a waiting list to get in. This tends to vary. Uh, there will be, in sort of three years' time, the, the areas where we are strong, it, there will be bend and flex, and they will be the areas we'll focus on. But what we do is, where there are any challenges with uh, recruitment, uh, we focus on those areas. We do a lot of advertising. We will welcome support from the communities. Uh, since I've been here, I think I have been out to visit all bar one between the volunteer station and the Perth and Kilmoss area. I've been through the Perth Fire Station Grizzly Fairway Watch. I, the only one I've yet to get to is Glenshee, and I think I've tried to visit during the lambing season, so <laughs> I was invited not to come till I've got a meeting in s uh, September. Right. So again, there are some challenges there, and there are some challenges in a lot of the smaller communities. Yeah. Uh, we are looking at ways we can be more efficient and effective in recruiting. Uh, sometimes we can be a wee bit cumbersome in our recruitment process. Uh, we try to be a bit more smooth and slick. Uh, and in the five years of the National Service, we have significantly changed our recruitment to make it uh, easier. Yeah. But I'm fairly confident there's still, there's still areas we can work on. Yeah. But the best way for us to recruit is to speak to our staff, get our staff to speak to the communities, because they are the heart and soul of the communities. They are in the communities and identify the community to encourage people to uh, to volunteer, really. Yeah. Yeah, any more questions for me? Yeah. Um, this is probably a more academic now because of the change in the weather, but it's a question that's been asked a couple of times when we had the hot, dry spell, uh, and we're told these are going to come regularly. Are we prepared for a potential wildfire in areas, rural areas? I mean, we always seem to have problems when they're burning heather in our part of the world. There's always something goes wrong. There, there the are often some wildfire. challenges around the Moorburn period. Mm. Uh, what we have is we have a, a national lead for wildfire, Bruce Farkasson, who is a local senior officer for Aberdeen. He has a, a wildfire strategy for Scotland. We are very experienced in the north at dealing with wildfires. A lot of them tend to be further north uh, in the, the highlands and in Grampian. But certainly when there are state conditions, and I have been in the instance that Courtney you spoke about earlier on a number of times, moving appliances about the, the north of Scotland, moving resources about the north of Scotland to make sure we have the, the right resources in the right place with appropriate standby coverage in it uh, to deal with any other incidents. We, have, we are ongoing developing a, a TAC advisor, a tactical advisor on wildfire. Uh, we're developing more of these, but we have some very, very experienced officers who uh, have a lot of knowledge in wildfires. Uh, so I'm very confident we have the right resources to deal with wildfires uh, throughout the north of Scotland. Thanks very much for that. Um, can we agree to note the report? Okay, thanks very much. Um, which takes us to uh, item two, which is the uh, Police Scotland uh, performance report, uh, which includes the uh, performance figures for the whole year for April 2017 to March uh, 2018, which were subject to uh, embargo at the time of our last meeting. Um, it also includes the first quarter uh, report for, for, for this year. Um, highlights of the annual report uh, include the reduction in crimes of violence by almost a quarter, uh, an increase in robbery detections and a reduction in domestic abuse um, offences, as well as an increase in the detection rate for shoplifting. Um, I'd like to invite uh, Inspector Kevin Chase to speak to the report. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, yes, uh, morning, convener uh, members. Uh, Graham Riddick, uh, Operations Superintendent, standing in for Paul Anderson, uh, who's away on court business. Uh, just before Kevin provides the, 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 the narrative around the local reports, just really just to provide a little context uh, in terms of policing in general uh, and take any questions in relation to that. Uh, we're very pleased as an organization um, that we now have a new chief constable uh, in place, who is Mr. Ian Livingston, who has been the interim chief constable for, for the last period. And uh, yesterday we had a, a visit to Tayside from our new deputy chief constable for local policing, uh, Fiona Taylor, um, who is also uh, a previously experienced officer uh, in policing in Scotland. So some very positive uh, additions to the force executive, which will give us some uh, stability uh, and direction going forward. 
in, in terms of policing within Tayside, it has been an extremely busy period for us over the last three to four months. Uh, we had an extremely challenging period which started uh, with the very tragic murder down in the Dunning area uh, several months ago, uh, followed very closely uh, by a murder investigation in Dundee, and then of course another very resource intensive investigation around a murder up in the Kiri Muir area. Uh, extremely challenging for us uh, resource-wise as a division with an impact right across uh, all the local policing areas within Tayside uh, and a huge amount of assistance coming from resources uh, across Scotland in terms of criminal investigation, uh, search and, and other specialisms to support local policing. In amongst that, of course, uh, it's been an extremely uh, busy summer for events. Um, right across Tayside, including the Open Golf uh, very recently in Carnoustie. Um, the visit of President Trump to Scotland had a significant impact again on resourcing within the division. And of course, we had uh, the European Championship Golf uh, recently at Glen Eagle. Um, Perth in particular has been very busy this summer with a, a range of, of new, uh, diverse and interesting events. And uh, Police Scotland have been delighted to support those and I think everyone will agree uh, that the majority of these events, and again, the diversity of them, has been hugely positive uh, for the city. Um, and uh, uh, hopefully this will, will, will set a precedent going forward. So that's really the context. Um, we, we remain very much focused on, on local policing. Kevin will touch upon the local elements of that, as I say, but a very uh, busy and challenging period for us here in Tayside uh, and indeed in Perth and Kinross over the last few months. So if there are any questions in terms of policing or that wider context, I'll, I'll quite happily take those. Uh, and if not, I'll pass over to Kevin for the local report. Okay, thanks very much for that. Uh, Councillor Braun, has got a question? Um, if I may, uh, Superintendent, just follow up on this question of police numbers that came up in my area just last month. Um, there was a, a community council meeting. Uh, it was at the time when President Trump was here, so I appreciate that was a drain, uh, but we had two officers turn up to do their usual report, and it transpired they were the only two officers on duty that night, covering Ayrith, Pitlochry, Fair Generally, which the courier picked up as a population, I think of approximately 8,000, I'm not sure if that's right, but it's a big area. Um, there was concern, as you can appreciate, that just two policemen were on duty. I think the concern was both for the protection of the public but also a great amount of concern for them themselves, that they had no immediate backup if anything went wrong, and if an officer went down or something. Uh, I just wonder if you might have a comment to that for the... the yeah, absolutely. I, mean, I, I think it's important to look at that in the wider context rather than take a, a single instance, which I think this was in many respects. Um, you know, there, there will be particular shifts, uh, particularly out in, in, in the rural areas of Perthshire, where you know it is possible that there, there are only uh, you know two maybe four officers on duty. Um, however, there is significant support available in Perth, you know, 24 hours a day. And the wider context of that is when we changed our operating model, so our locality and, and, and community model, going back, we always promised we would we would review particularly the the, the spread of community officers uh, ac across uh, rural Perth and Kinross. Uh, and we actually did that, and that very much recognised uh, the level of demand, particularly in the Blair Gallery and Rattray section, as a result of which, uh, as Kevin will confirm, you know, over the last few months in a staged basis, we actually have realigned resource into that section. So with an additional six constables have gone into Blair Gallery, and indeed an extra sergeant to, to, to support that uplift I in officers. So the section, uh, more broadly, is actually better staffed than it was uh, a year ago. So I think it's important to consider in that context that we actually haven't taken resource away from the section, we've actually added to it. But there will be uh, particular times, and again, the, the visit of President Trump was particularly challenging right across Scotland in terms of how that drained resource. Um, but I think the context is, is important. Thank you for that, I understand what you're saying. As I say, with regard to the officers themselves, uh, you know, Perth is 20 odd minutes with sirens going at least, as I thought, to support if something goes wrong. I think what also is a, 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 a thing that came up was that, uh, which is known in the paper, I think a, a week or two before on a Saturday night, for some reason, Blair Gallery, everything kicked off. 
uh, it was quite a night for assaults and whatever. Uh, if that happened again, we're just too often told. I think this is what the concern is, that their backup is 20, 25 minutes away. Yes, that can be the case, um, but you know, incidents where you know disorder flares like that are relatively uncommon, uh, and in fact, you know, if we if we consider um, you know particular issues we had going back maybe two three years, particularly with Bray Mar night, um, but the last couple of years uh, have been really good up in Blair Gallery, so I think there have been some real positive differences. Um, I do understand. I mean, I dread to think uh, of any occasion where officers will will, will come to harm. Um, 20, 25 minutes away, yes, there is support and, and it is there 24-7. We also have our roads policing colleagues who are out on the roads. and We also have our colleagues, um, of course, based in, in Perth in the armed response vehicles who can provide support more broadly uh, across the area. Um, but yes, I'm very conscious of that, um, particularly uh, officers, you know, driving on roads in winter. Personally, you know, I've, I've been an officer in, in isolated stations in, in rural areas and often been the only person on duty where there is no support um, and it's challenging and, and you adapt your policing accordingly. But uh, very conscious of that and I, I don't for a, a minute uh, minimise uh, any consideration of, of the risks to officers. Thank you very much. Councillor Dreister. Thank you, convener. <coughs> I just had one uh, high-level question, which was, um, and, and you've, you, you've explained very clearly the, um, the, the number of um, events and uh, um, crimes, etc., that have come together in the last quarter that have um, caused uh, the, the service to be stretched, shall we say. Um, some of the, um, most of the uh, detection rate indicators in the quarter just ended in June um, have, have fallen, um, but I, I also know obviously that they have they improved over like the 12 month period. So would it be fair to link the two, i.e. The, the number of special events that you've outlined uh, and the uh, detection rates especially of more minor crimes? Um, <laughs> I think it's probably important to look at the figures at the end of quarter two, um, because that's where the, the, the real impact will be felt. Um, I would like to think that generally in terms of our performance, um, those additional demands haven't placed uh, you know, too much of a negative impact on our performance. Often we're, we're very conscious as a service that it's some of the other routine business, uh, perhaps, that, that, that has lapsed a wee bit. Um, so for example, recently we, we've had uh, days of action in terms of the execution of warrants, uh, court citations, etc., because some of that more administrative business is is the business that perhaps tends to, to lapse slightly when when we get the real operational demand. Uh, but it's important that we keep an eye on on, on that stuff as well. So I think uh, the the end of quarter two figures uh, will will be quite positive, and I think that's probably where we will actually start to see whether there's been that impact or not. I I don't know whether. Um Inspector Kevin Chase will be covering it, or whether you would wish to um, comment on uh, the, the sequence of armed robberies in, in Dundee and in, in Bergauri. Um, yes, I think uh, we're probably putting some, some more information out into the media today. Um, I think uh, we have confirmed that those three robberies uh, at the weekend were linked, um, and uh, we had some very positive developments over the last 24 hours in, in terms of detecting uh, those particular crimes. Um, it was uh, th three crimes that took place over a very short uh, space of time. As I say, well, they are clearly linked uh, in, in our view uh, and uh, the developments in terms of the investigation over the, the, the last 24 hours uh, have moved that on significantly. Are there any other questions? Okay, thank you, Karina. Uh, it's my intention, first of all, to go for the annual figures. So if you have uh, the copy of the police report there in front of you, I think that will start from page 12 on my other course. I'm not too sure what that will be on, on your papers. I'd just li like to highlight some of the figures that we have. Page 56 of the, of the pack. Okay, it's my intention just to go through some of the positives, first of all, in terms of total number of Group 1 crimes of violence, 
We've noticed a significant decrease over the course of the last financial year to the extent of almost 25% down. Uh, again, with serious assault, which is item number seven. Again, that's uh, shown another significant decrease as well. Um, in terms of that, it's a 30% reduction. I'll come on to the lobby shortly. In terms of other positive news, I return you to item number 26, which is on my paperwork. It's number 14. I think I've got probably about 58 on your papers in front of you. Theft how the housebreaking detection rate. We've had an increase in our detected housebreakings over the year. That's gone up by 12% uh, in terms of our detections. I return to some of the figures which we have uh, highlighted uh, in terms of some of the work that we are aware of. The robberies have, have increased. However, I need to advise with that one, we are talking about low base numbers, but more importantly as well, although the robberies have increased from low base figures, our detection rate has also increased in line with that. I've already noted a slight decrease, in, uh, sorry, a slight increase in item number 11, which is a common assault. Uh, common assaults have gone up slightly, but our detection rate has also increased in relation to that as well. If we turn to item number 25, we go back to uh, page, I think it's 56, which in terms of that is the number of detection for drug supplies. Uh, again, we are, are down on those figures. Um, that could well be uh, some events that we don't have here anymore. For example, tea in the park could be one example for that. Item number 29, shoplifting has increased um, over the reporting period. Um, and item number 35, again, we say our rate detection rate is slightly down. Um, and that is that could be for a whole host of reasons because of the actual type of crime that tends to be. And also we are aware of obviously the increase that's been mentioned earlier in the previous discussions with our colleagues in the fire service, the increase in the numbers of persons killed on a road has gone up slightly from 10 to 12 in the reporting period under review. So if you'd like to convene, I'll take some questions now on the annual report and thereafter I'll focus on the first quarter of the course. Okay, thank you very much. That we have questions on the annual report. Um, I, I wanted to, to ask if there was any um, pattern to the, 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 the increase in robbery or if, we, if, if there was anything in particular that caused that spike. No, not particularly. The, the one area where we did have um, the increase in robberies was in, in Perth City Centre itself. Um, there wasn't a particular pattern as such. Um, sometimes the victims and the offenders knew each other comment on that so but uh, in terms of the actual patterns themselves it certainly would seem to be more within the city than it is in more rural areas across the country perhaps. Councillor McEwen. The statistics you have on the theft by shoplifting do the do you collect your data in such a way that you could break that down because I'm, I'm aware that there are some social cases where people are shoplifting food because they have no money, they are in a dire situation. And the, and the housing service have helped individuals and helped resolve these issues. But obviously, this is a, a slightly different aspect than shoplifting for personal gain. This is shoplifting for a different purpose. Do you collect the data in such a way that we could see that separated? I, I, to be fair, that, that would be difficult for us to um, collate. I mean, the one thing we do look at is when we do have our shoplifters and our morning operational meetings, the one thing we look at is the offender, the background, the circumstances, because we are aware there may be other vulnerability factors, shall I say, in terms of that. Um, it would be a difficult for ourselves to collate those figures in terms of splitting it down to shoplifting for gain, as we say, shoplifting for food shortages or other social factors, if you like, that, that would be extremely difficult for us to do that. Councillor Drysdale. <coughs> Thank you, convener. Um, a 17% increase in the number of complaints regarding disorder uh, between 16-17 um, and 17-18. Um, Later on in, in another paper that uh, we're going to notice as well the, the effect that this uh, level of um, antisocial behaviour 
has on uh, the Council's ability to respond to it. Um, we're talking about petty crime, we're talking about um, Friday night, Saturday night um, fights and uh, other, other disorder. Uh, is resourcing in Perth City Centre sufficient in your view to deal with that problem um, as well as you would like to? Yeah, it is. And we, we also have an additional community team now that we've employed in Perth City Centre within the last six months as well. So we have now got one additional sergeant and eight additional officers as well that are now a Perth City community team. So we now have two community teams in Perth. So in answer to the question, yeah, I, we do have sufficient resources for that. And I've hopefully got no good news when I go into quarter one in relation to the overall disorder figures compared to the previous year. Um, I think it might also be worth worthwhile mentioning, and, and, and perhaps um, you, you can expand on the um, the, the um, assistance that we, we, we've um, uh, received from um, out of area uh, 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 police um, to deal with um, the, the, the uh, youth causing annoyance um, issues that uh, um, uh, had um, affected the city centre locations, South Inch, um, Nori Miller, um, uh, the Moncrief Island. Uh, for, for, for a considerable period and perhaps co comment more on the, um, the partnership working with the Council's Community Safety Team and, and Warden Service in response to that? Yeah, the, we had additional resources for the problems that we suffered uh, on the South Finch area with uh, resources come from police resources initially coming from out with uh, Perth and Kinross out with Tayside Division uh, further across uh, Scotland and coming into assist. That is one part of the South Finch. I'm aware of obviously there's a partnership approach that's being adopted in relation to the longest term problem solving, and that's including the likes of the antisocial behaviour, community awareness team, youth services. Um, I'm sure there are other partners that are involved in that that I probably have missed off there, but there is a wider partnership approach to tackling those particular problems. And I'm hoping I got some good news for when I talk about quarter one on, on a result response to that. Thanks uh, for that. Um, I wanted to um, ask about Indicator 8 on page 13, um, which reports that 81.3% of domestic abuse bail checks were conducted within 24 hours against a target of 95%. Um, I just wonder if you could tell us what those checks um, consist of um, and you know whether the, 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 the short shortfall on the target was picked up within, for example, the next 24 hours, um, or whether there, 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 there may be cause for concern um, regarding the, the, the safety of victims of domestic abuse? Uh, these, uh, what, what these domestic bail checks are is when a perpetrator is released from court on bail, it's the responsibility of Police Scotland to notify the victim of the offence um, of any bail conditions that the perpetrator has. Ultimately, we are targeted to have that message completed within 24 hours, which is uh, a face-to-face -face visit rather than a telephone call. So that's in terms of the safety advice and the safety checks on them. I'm, I'm going to say quite often, but there are on occasions where the victim is particularly difficult to get hold of, whether it's work commitments, whether it's uh, social commitment or whether they are not returning any kind of cards that we leave at the address asking for them to make contact with ourselves. Um, so that means that we would pick that up the following day. These incidents are recorded on our command and control system on a graded pretty highly, so they are pursued per shift. Um, that above all that, any victim of domestic violence um, will also receive safety advice at the time of that particular incident. So we have a safety plan in place for those victims um, in respect of the actual incident they suffered, even if that perpetrator is released without charge. So we always have the safety first and the investigation will take that course. Okay, thanks very much for that. If there aren't any, uh, okay, Councillor Braun. This, uh, this covers both figures, it, it doesn't have any figures for drink driving. Um, and the, obviously with the lowering of the uh, limit, the alcohol limit, um, I was just wondering how that, that compared. I, I can't comment on the overall annual figures for drink driving. Um, I've been told nationally it's not something we report on 
uh, across the counties of Scotland. Um, I, I have previously asked for it and requested it and asked for it, but I get back it's not a full Scotland authority figure. Okay, that's maybe something that we'll we'll, we'll pursue further. Thanks. Um, would you wish to speak to the first quarter report, John? Yes, I'll, I'll, I'll refer back to the start of the report. I'm just going to do some exceptional reporting um, on our main categories. So it's on um, putting victims at the heart of what we do is the first context of this report. I, um, but I highlight paragraph four in relation to this report. I, um, when we get reports of domestic violence uh, at times, uh, we will also go and see previous partners this one particular instance has led to one male uh, being charged with five different victim offences, several uh, offences in total. He's now currently on remand awaiting trial in relation to those offences on his different victims. I'd also like to report on there is a hate crime incident in June in Blair Gowdy where a male victim was assaulted by another male because of his perceived sexuality. The, uh, as a result of that, that male's been arrested and he's awaiting a petition in relation to going uh, to court for that incident. Tackling crime and antisocial behaviour, as my superintendent uh, briefly mentioned earlier, um, the tragic uh, murder of Annalise Johnson on the 10th of May, uh, as you, most of you will be aware, one person's been arrested in relation to that inquiry. I'll not make any further comments in relation to that. Other items, uh, successes, two males from Kakadi were arrested for four thefts, including one house breaking down in Kinross. They were also charged with similar offences up in, uh, on the boundary of Perth, um, which they both captured by ourselves. Um, one such success also in Creef, uh, whereby a female broke into one of the shops on the high street. Um, officers attended and, and followed her trail, shall I say, all the way back to her home address, so that led to her arrest in relation to that crime. Some of you may be aware um, of some of the areas, Operation Ironworks, which is right on the uh, St. Philan's boundary in my particular area. Um, Operation Ironworks is a national park antisocial behaviour operation. That's commenced again uh, for the summer period. In relation to incidents at the prison, we've had some particular notable successes in terms of our proactive work with HMP Perth. In particular, you know, 40 um, crimes have been reported from proactive work. When I say 40, what that tends to mean, it means prohibited articles and drugs were being confiscated. Some of our operations have led to those successes. If we move on to protecting vulnerable people, Operation Monada was delivered in May. That's in relation to bogus workman type crimes. Um, we ha had several um, proactive visits to banks and also areas where we knew the elderly, uh, I'm not going to just say it was elderly people who were targeted these crimes, but we know that these people do get targeted, so we made sure that we passed out our educational messages to them. On the 3rd of May, the Financial Harm Seminar was held there at the Jewish Centre in Perth. I'm aware some of the local uh, councillors did attend that. I compared it at the last minute. However, uh, I'm pleased to say that 90 people who did attend uh, hopefully received some educational information. And wh what I will say on that is one particular um, input from a Perth and Kinross council employee about her dad was particularly hard hitting for those who weren't. Um, scam awareness, I don't know if any of you had seen the fake ATM that's been in the high street a couple of times already. It's well worth seeing if you are about. Uh, and when it is out, it just highlights the people the difference between a fake ATM and a, a real ATM. Um, annual safe tidies events, which is obviously the fire service also highlighted earlier. 1,500 uh, P7 school children across most of Perth and Kinross Council attended that event. Moving on to maintaining public safety. Um, tragically, there's been three fatalities on our roads across the reported period. 5th of April on the A923 near to Dundocky Crossroads, a male motorcyclist tragically been killed there. 22nd of May on the A9 at Dunkeld uh, and a male pedal cyclist was killed after a collision uh, with a refuse lorry near to Creech. Just one other item of note in relation to maintaining public safety is uh, obviously my superintendent mentioned earlier over all the events we've had over the first reporting period including the tape. 
World Medieval Concert, Perth Faith Festival, and also the BBC Biggest Weekend. I think pleased to say there was only five relatively min minor crimes recorded for the Biggest Weekend. And I'll move on to our quarterly figures, which is on page, let's get the pages right, sorry, you'll bear with me because there's figures everywhere. Yeah, on my page, it's page eight. And I'm just on the next page from our last report. I'm pleased to announce at the moment on number 11, um, minor assaults are down by 20%. Number 12, our complaints regarding disorder are down by 17%. Um, number 29, shoplifting. Our shoplifting figures are down by 17%. And finally, number 31, which I think is the biggest, uh, the, the happiest report I can give you, vandalism and malicious mischief is down by nearly a half for quarter one. Um, if you don't know what malicious mischief is, it's the most expensive form of vandalism over a certain amount. It's We normally, as a rule, use it as £5,000 worth of vandalism. In terms of the negatives, group one, violent crime, as you'll see, number one on that, there is just a slight increase in terms of the numbers. Again, we are talking about low base numbers. It's gone from 32 to 42. Uh, 16, which is domestic uh, abuse. Again, our detection rate is slightly down on that one. Um, however, what I will say is that in terms of domestic abuse, this is a snapshot in time as well. So we will still be continuing investigations if a snapshot is taken. And finally, um, 33, uh, which was the sexual crimes. What I will say on that one is, I know this is it's obviously a marked increase. Um, we have had an operation in relation to a particular individual, which I mentioned earlier, which has led to uh, that individual being charged with a number of sexual offences. It also could be seen as being um, some victims are more confident to come forward to the police as well. So that concludes the first quarter of the report, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Councillor Gray. Thank you. Thank you for that report. Um, road safety and road crime, I see speeding uh, at a fair spike. Uh, was most of this attributable to the two, uh, two occasions in May when you actually had spent weekends uh, on the roads? Sorry, can I, I've never heard. Can you repeat the question? Um, I'm referring to number 37, which was speeding yeah. on the roads. There was a fair, a good spike at that time, or a bad spike, I should say. Um, but it did, it did find plenty of rotten apples in the barrel, it would seem. And uh, was this spike attributable to the two weekends when you were focusing on road traffic? I know we uh, have a particular operation in terms of targeting motorcyclists. It's when certain events are taking place over our border of Fife. Um, so that we do have uh, operations that are ongoing throughout the year in relation to that. We highlight particular dates that we, we know there would be a possible issue with speeding. But also in, in relation to that, the community team are out now as well uh, with speed and with handheld radar. Um, so they are also targeting some of the, I'm not going to use the word hot spots, but some areas that where the com wider community have got concerns and I've mentioned in the past. Um, so there is a bit of both in that in terms of directed operations but also the wider community concerns which have led to some of the criminal officers going out and tackling the speeding issues. Yeah. I did mention it because the figures, the increase in figures seem to be similar to what they were on the two weekends in May uh, and I'm looking at the effectiveness of these weekends it would suggest to me that they are very useful. We're all affected, every one of us, by road traffic incidents and speeding etc uh, and to my mind it is time very well spent yeah the one thing i would say is uh, if you're talking about the maintaining public safety fourth paragraph down those figures for the motorcycle safety campaigns across the whole of tayside so that the figures are showing uh, as a reflection okay. across the whole of tayside not just for perth and kinross as well yeah thank you very much thanks i certainly uh, uh, took part in the uh, Scams Awareness uh, event on the High Street with the demonstration of the um, adapted um, 
uh, uh, cash dispenser machines. Um, the, so I think the change or the, the, the development of the sophistication um, of the, 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 the card readers and the, the sort of pinhole cameras, um, you know, fitted to um, plastic, the exact shade of same shade of the of the machines and contours of the of the machines, um, was something of a, a, a revelation. You know, I think previously at uh, these sort of devices had been um, fairly uh, clumsy, but now are you know particularly uh, hard to spot unless you know what to what to look for, uh, and what you're looking for you know is a a, a, a pinhole in a in a bit of plastic molding, um, and a very small piece of metal within the uh, the, the card the card slot. Um, so it's particularly useful um, to know what to to, to, to look for, um, and second, certainly recommend um, members have a look at the. Uh, the, 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 the machines with uh, these uh, adaptations that the police can, can provide. Are there any other questions? Councillor Drysdale. Thank you, Convener. Um, are you able to, to, um, to say how Perthington Ross compares with the national picture? Um, uh, you know, wh wh where do we sit? I mean, just a, a general observation in terms of the, of the, the main stats uh, and if you are or if you aren't, would it be possible maybe on an annual basis going forward to have some form of report that, that gives us that picture? I can't comment to this, uh, to this meeting today. I will take those notes away and I'll pass that back, my feedback back to Daniel. So uh, I can't possibly comment in terms of our services and the SOS standard. Thanks for that, Kevin. Um, Chief Superintendent Murgat, I think you want to speak first. Yeah, just in answer to that, uh, I, I can advise that Police Scotland will probably within the next couple of weeks be releasing the <laughs> quarter one management information. Uh, those information are around all the, 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 the crime groups as discussed and they are broken down by local authority, um, which does enable like, you to make that comparison with other local authority areas. So th that information should be available in the public domain, uh, hopefully within the next few weeks. I also wanted to ask whether we should treat um, the reduction in the number of complaints regarding disorder with, 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 with some caution. It's my understanding that um, last year we were counting every single caller report of, of, of um, d disorder, antisocial behaviour. Um, so if we got six calls about something happening on the, si um, on the South Inch, that was six recorded incidents. Now, if we get those six calls about the same incident, it's recorded as, as a single incident. So, I, I take that point. However, if I also say that vandalism and minor, mal I'd say minor for malicious mischief is down by nearly a half which is actually attributable as a result of disorder calls. I'd say it is still disorder does appear to be going down. And long may we continue. Thanks, Convener. It's some months since the minimum pricing of alcohol was introduced. Um, some of these reductions are welcome. Is there any link in that process that you can detect so far, or is it too early days? I think that would be fair to say it would be too early to say. Are we doing any monitoring of that to link some of the, the, the reporting with the, the Availability, because some of the, some of the incidents that we've seen some reduction in are, are to do with the consumption of alcohol, sometimes illicitly. So, I just wonder if there's any work being done on on, on seeing what cause and effect is. The only anecdotal evidence that I have really is that it hasn't made any difference to the availability for drink for for, for young people. Um, certainly, in speaking to um, our local community uh, police officer yesterday, he said that uh, he was removing alcohol. Um, from from youngsters in the in, in the Norrie Miller, and then an hour later they had um, replenished their supplies. So it didn't seem to be um, a price sensitive issue for uh, for for those people. So, sadly, you're correct. Are there any other questions, um, or can we agree to note the report? Agreed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and that now takes us back to uh, item four on the agenda, which is the. Um, Community planning partnership update, which I thought for a moment I'd lost my introduction. Um, as I said, paper four is the community planning partnership update, which includes details of the Strathern and Strathallan uh, local action partnership update to the community planning partnership, 
uh, and details of the community investment fund devolved to uh, local planning partnerships, uh, local ac action partnerships at a ward based level. Um, the ability of LAPS to formally work at a smaller geographical basis is a further step in the evolution of local action partnerships um, closer to identifiable and more cohesive community bases. Um, I think the director was going to make a, a brief comment on the, on, on the report and then we can open to questions. Um, thank you, convener. Um, it's just a very brief update in terms of the community investment fund. I was speaking to the community planning team um, earlier um, and they have informed me while information has gone out to the chairs and leads of um, all of the local action partnerships, then the information is contained in the time scale and um, the timetable on page 16 of the, the documents um, has slipped slightly, unfortunately. So my understanding is that the initial awareness raising publicity will be ready to go out by the end of this week. Um, and therefore for um, wards one to seven, um, you know, sort of what they're looking at is slipping back, you know, sort of the opening of applications and the sign and, and the return dates for that by one week, which would mean that it, rather than the, well, it's actually more than one week looking at it, it would be the um, 10th of September with a close date of the 5th of October. Okay, thank you for uh, that. Councillor Gray. to assess that applications were within already um, should this meeting perhaps be postponed or cancelled. Well, great. I'll feed that back to both Jim and um, David Stokoe and we'll see what we can you. do with that, Councillor Gray. This is for tomorrow, this meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Ahern. Just a quick one. If they slip in the dates for wards 1 to 7, is that going to have any effect on the 8 to 12 which follow it? That's not my understanding that the, you know, sort of the, those dates will just continue as they have shown in the timetable. Councillor Waters. Uh, thank you. I think it's good that we're getting some information about how this will be handled, the investment fund. Will there be a presentation be given to each of the local partnerships on how this will be uh, administered? Um, my understanding that it would be part of, you know, sort of the local action partnerships, but the documentation that's going out should be very clear in terms of how to apply, what the scoring matrix is, and how they will be assessed. Are there any other questions? Can we agree to note the report? Thank you. Uh, item six is the uh, first housing and environment service uh, business and improvement plan for the new combined service. Um, the plan is split into sections in alignment with the council's uh, strategic objectives and the performance indicator specify um, which council committee is responsible for monitoring and scrutinizing uh, performance and progress. Uh, today we will confine our scrutiny and questions to the indicators marked as being within this committee's remit uh, and other committees will examine the other indicators. Uh, tackling homelessness and the delivery of new affordable housing in, of the right type in the right place and to meet local needs both general and special are among the commitments uh, and we will undertakings that have been made within the report. Uh, community empowerment to enable communities to address the issues uh, they identify uh, and which are important to them with solutions devised by local communities through participatory budgeting and devolution of power and resources through the local community investment funds uh, will be the hallmarks of the new way of working with communities uh, and participative democracy, active citizenship, uh, making for an exciting year ahead. Uh, and I'd like to invite the Director of the Housing Environment Service uh, to speak to the report. Thank you, convener. Um, I'm pleased to introduce the first business management and improvement plan for housing and environment since the formation of the new service in the 1st of April um, this year. The BMIP is the result of a number of sessions held with the service managers and team leaders from across the new service, and these have proved to be an excellent way of bringing the service together. This high level of input engagement has led to the development of the combined service aims, along with the culture we wish to create across the whole service, which are outlined on page um, 70 of the report. 
the four service aims combine those of both previous um, old services and draw the new service together in ways which both former staff groups can readily identify with. We've undertaken a cross-service self-evaluation and, and it's from this that our new BMIP has been created. We've also taken the corporate and community plans into consideration and as such, our first BMIP reflects both these documents in terms of strategic aims, the contribution the service will make to their delivery, the commitments that we're making for the next year, um, along with the targets against which we'll me measure our performance. In addition, our BMIP reflects the annual performance reports for the old services, which were approved during the last committee cycle. And we've looked to be realistic in what we aim to do, taking into account you know, future financial challenges, increasing demands for our services, as well as what we know in terms of emerging legislation and national priorities, such as homelessness and welfare reform. Our BMIP has to be a strategic high-level document and as such it can't possibly reflect all of the work undertaken by the many and diverse teams across the service. These will be picked up through individual team plans which will be monitored by relevant managers across the service and there will also be policies and strategies such as the local housing strategy which we'll be discussing later which will support the overall work of the service. Over the course of the next year we may not get everything right um, and we may not ma manage to do everything that we've outlined within the document. But what is clear um, from the work that we've undertaken as the new service, that there is a huge degree of commitment and energy across all of the teams. And that by working together with yourselves, um, with our partners and our communities, we will be focused on delivering the best services we possibly can. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Councillor Bailey. Thank you. Um, I'm looking at page 76 of the report, so this is page 10 of the appendix. Um, there's a couple of targets on that page where it seems we're targeting either a steady state or um, actually, so the percentage of rent due, it seems we're giving ourselves a bit of headroom there and interested to know what the reason for that is. And then a follow-up question is, it seems we're targeting to um, decrease the number of employees paid the living wage um, on the bottom row there. Um, that was my question. Okay, in terms of your, uh, the answer to your first question in terms of the target setting, we took a decision when we reviewed this BMIP, and as Barbara has explained, it's a new BMIP for the, the brand new service. So you'll see in many of the targets, we flatlined them for the next <coughs> few years. What we will be doing during the course of this year uh, for the beginning of next year is setting uh, more smart stretch targets going forward. In terms of the particular target in relation to um, voids at the top of page 76 there. We've had a significant increase in the level of voids um, in the current year. We had an 11% increase during last year. We're projecting uh, a 15 to 16% increase in voids this year. And a lot of that is down to the very positive work through our new builds, uh, through our buyback scheme, and through our vacancy chain management through our allocations policy. But because of that, clearly the actual level of void, void rent loss is likely to increase slightly. So we've put the target in at 0.8%. What I would say is uh, our target uh, and our, our turnover of voids remain significantly better than the national average. We sit at an average of about 27 to 28 days. The national average is 36 days. And with this particular indicator for void rent loss, we've got 0.8 in terms of void rent loss. The national average currently sits at 0.9. So what we're really focusing on is continuing with vacancy chains to get the good outcomes for people on the waiting list and our homeless clients. But that will mean that's created quite a lot of operational activity for our trades team in terms of void turnover. And I think the comment that I would make about the, the, the living wage is, is that it's actually a good thing that that, that that percentage is decreasing because the minimum, min, living wage is basically the minimum wage on the council, so therefore there's an increasing proportion or percentage of employees who are above the, the, the living wage. Alistair. Okay, thank you, convener. I was misunderstanding that, and I was perhaps imagining people were below the living wage if we change that target, but that's perfect. Thank you. Councillor McEwen. I suppose my question is a very similar one. On page page nine of the report, there's a couple of statistics that are currently very good. Our, our gross percentage rent arrears is only about 10%, and our actual 
rent collection rates are extremely high. And, but the figures that we're projecting are actually an improvement on those figures yet again. But then I look in the report elsewhere, in the BMIP report we mentioned universal credit and welfare reform. And we mentioned that this is going to have a major and almost certain impact on the ability of our residents to pay their rent. So it seems rather unusual <coughs> that we see an improving situation with such demand on our residents. Uh, so that's the first question I have. The second question I have following on from that is that we're going to have residents who are certainly going to end up in arrears because of welfare reform and universal credit. As a council, are we going to be presented with a, a choice to actually write off those arrears because we'll never ever get them back? You know, the money that those residents haven't received from the welfare system is in the piggy bank at Westminster. At, at Westminster. It's not something that they're going to get down the line to then pay their arrears. Um, certainly, um, as was reported to, I am pretty sure this committee, or perhaps might have been the Strategic Policy and, and Resources uh, c Committee, we we're going to have um, a much more uh, rigorous uh, process of, of writing off uh, un unrecoverable uh, debt to the, 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 the Council and to the, 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 the Housing um, Revenue uh, a a Account, and um, you know, the Head of Housing can uh, uh, speak to that more. Tom, I'm sorry, but I kind of lost track of what your first question is, so I, I could ask you to repeat that, and perhaps uh, Claire can uh, address that issue. Certainly. Uh, my first question is around our projected improvement in our ability to actually uh, get rent from our, our residents and the amount of arrears that we're going to grow, percentage of arrears and the actual rate collected. We, we have an improving number. We and contradict ourselves in this report. No, and, and I think that improving number is related to, to the much more regular pattern of, of, of write-off as well, but uh, I'll, I'll let the director provide you more detail on that. Okay, thank you, and um, thank you for the question, um, Councillor McEwen. Um, I think we'll do a double um, header on the, the response to this. Um, the report um, at SPNR, uh, you know, sort of in June, um, in terms of debt write-off, um, wrote off almost a million pounds of, of, of rent arrears um, over a period of about eight years. Um, and one of the reasons for you know, taking that report and for asking for that is that you know, sort of, for trying to collect you know, sort of very, very old debt was just becoming more and more impossible for, you know, sort of for staff. Um, you know, sort of, and that actually puts us on a par with many other councils in terms of how they were writing off their debt. So that's one of the reasons why we're predicting that there will be um, a, re a reduction in rent arrears because we're not carrying that you know, sort of old debt forward. Um, you know, sort of, but this also then allows the team to be much more um, you know, sort of preventative you know, sort of in trying to stop people from get getting into rent arrears, so focusing on that rather than going back and focusing on you know, sort of, of, of debt that we probably would never get. Um, you know, sort of, and we've also, we're also piloting approach within some of the localities in relation to very small teams, you know, sort of looking at how we pick up you know, sort of some of that rent arrears as well. Um, and if that's successful, then we would be modelling that through all of the other ones. But in terms of the specifics, then I'll just let you know, sort of Claire answer that. Okay, I think Barbara's probably fully answered the question there. But in, t in terms of, just to add a wee bit more in terms of uh, the gross rent arrears targets, um, the current national average for gross rent arrears sits at about 6.5%. So you can see that we year to date or over the last few years have performed poorly I would say against the national average because of what Barbara's just explained in terms of the write-off our calculation is that once that write-off comes off at the end of this year that will bring us in line with the national average so that will sit significantly lower than our targets so the target does reflect what we are projecting in terms of the impact of universal credit and I can give you just a quick update and Michelle might want to correct these figures for me. As you know, full, full life service of universal credit was introduced on the 13th of June of this year. So far year to date, we've got 202 tenants on universal credit and they currently collectively have about 176,000 arrears. So 
there is an issue for us there. We're continuing through the range of supports uh, that we're putting in place to support our tenants to maximise their incomes. So the target there in terms of the 9% and 8% going forward takes that into account. So the combination between the improved performance of the write-off but the challenges that we're facing ahead in terms of universal credit. And I think it's also um, worthwhile um, mentioning the fact that um, our, our, our tenants, through the consultation that we had uh, over the housing revenue account and, 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 and budget, uh, were clear that they wanted to establish um, a, a support fund and contingency fund to support um, their, 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 their um, fellow, fellow tenants who experienced difficulty because of um, universal credit. So, do you want a supplementary? So, going forward, we are now changing how we record rent arrears. So it isn't really a representative money loss to the council because you're actually writing it off. So the, the how we're measuring this figure now completely changes as we go forward. Because historically, it has that money you've never been able to collect. And I understand the write-off. But going forward as a committee and scrutinising how we perform on rent arrears, if we keep writing it off, that figure will always be low and that gives us as a committee no no sense of what actually is truly happening of the actual rent money lost so it's as if there needs to be another statistic in there to tell us the actual volume amount of money lost and written off and in conjunction with the actual percentage rent arrears that you need both numbers to describe the system because you've just changed the system because you're writing the arrears off quicker I'm not entirely sure that that's the um, the, the, the case, Tom. Um, I mean, I think it is the case that um, you know figures such as the rent collected as a percentage of of total rent due could end up being over a um, hundred percent. You could end up with a hundred and two percent if you were uh, if you were successful in collecting a lot of um, historic debt. Um, but that has always been the case, um, and I think you know we have actually artificially depressed how good we were um, at collecting rent by not doing. Um, regular enough write-offs in the in, in the past so yeah there may be a, a, a bit of a dramatic shift in in, in in our performance but I think it's a much more accurate um, reporting of the the, 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 the real situation um, but I'll, I'll, I'll be prepared to be corrected on that if anybody wants to I think just to add to that in terms of the write-offs I think just to to give committee a reassurance historically as Barbara indicated we have not been putting forward or writing off the same level as other local authorities have. What we did this year was to bring ourselves in line with other local authorities. So the national average for write-offs ranged between 30 to 37 percent over the past few years. We were writing off historically significantly lower levels than that. So that's, that's one point so we've brought ourselves in line. Another measure, this, the, the gross rent arrears takes into account former tenant arrears. What I would also like to reassure committee about is we measure our current, uh, current arrears, current net current arrears, and we have had significantly or ongoing improvement in terms of that over uh, the last few years. We're actually currently sitting at 8.78% um, current arrears, which is our lowest recorded figure uh, since the end, well, since prior to 16-17. So we're making good progress uh, with a range of measures that we've put in place. And I think you know what this committee um, wants to be satisfied um, about is that you know where our tenants um, get into debt and arrears that we respond rapidly uh, to provide the, the the supports to them uh, to make sure that there are you know affordable repayment plans in place to make sure that you know income maximisation um, services are 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 provided um, and and that you know the, you know sort of access. Of ability to, to, to you know, um, financial support through things like the credit union are, are, are also in, 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 in place. So, yeah. But it's, it's not the service itself and the activities that we do and how we support our residents that I'm questioning. It's how we interpret that as councillors when we get these type of reports. I just think that's the question I was raising, not the actual. I'm very happy to have, have a discussion with you and, and, and with the officers as to uh, you know if there's something that we can do to make that clearer to, to members of the committee. So, Councillor Drysdale. Thank you, convener. Uh, I wanted to speak about homelessness. Um, um, the the figures 
for 17-18 are significantly worse in terms of number of applicants assessed for homelessness. Uh, gone from 706 to 829. Uh, can you give some background to, to why that is? Sorry, that's on page 78 or page 12 of the report. Okay, I, am, I think we, we have discussed some of this in, 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 in the past, that we have had a, a, an increasing uh, number of presentations uh, of people uh, uh, who, who uh, claim to be uh, homeless or pre present as, as homeless to, to, to the service. Um, we record all of them now as, as, as being homeless um, rather than a, a, a waiting to conduct a, an assessment of whether they are actually homeless. Um, so although the number of presentations has increased, and that was partly to do uh, with um, addressing issues raised by the, um, the, the housing regulator, uh, uh, with concerns about uh, gatekeeping, which we didn't feel were genuine, um, but we adapted our practice um, in response uh, to, to that. Uh, but the number of people uh, actually assessed as being uh, homeless has remained uh, uh, constant or steady. But uh, I, I think that, that's not the figures I'm looking at. Sorry, uh, convener, but uh, there are th um, two data fields here. Uh, one, the number of households presenting at home, presenting as homeless has gone from 825 to 999, and the number of applicants assessed as homeless has gone from 706 to 829. Uh, okay, so yeah, I, as, I, as I said, that the, the, the number of homeless presentations uh, has increased, and I've given you some of the background uh, to that. Um, it, was, it was my understanding that the number of people assessed as being homeless had remained constant. Um, it would appear that that isn't correct, uh, g given the, the, the figures that are in the report. Uh, and perhaps Claire can comment on that. Yeah. Okay, so the, the figure, as you can see, I think as Councillor Barrett has explained there, the actual number of homeless presentations, what we have to do is we have to ensure open access to our service. We can't have a target-driven service and we don't want to uh, gatekeep and preclude people from accessing. We need to establish whether or not they are homeless and indeed ensure that they've got uh, open access to our services. So yes, we have had an increase in the total number of presentations for that reason. And then what we do is we, the next stage is to actually assess whether or not the household is homeless. You will see, yes, there has been an increase in the actual number of households that were assessed as homeless, but the period thr through which we're working with the household from the point they contact us for advice and assistance and support, our housing options and housing support team work very, very closely with the household. So the actual number that required settled accommodation, because in many instances we managed to prevent homelessness before it actually occurred, was actually uh, just over 750 uh, households that actually required settled accommodation. Because through the pre preventative work that we undertook uh, during that period, uh, we were able to prevent homelessness occurring. Uh, and so a smaller number than the 829 actually went on to require uh, settled accommodation. There are a whole range of different outcomes that we measure, and again, it goes in terms of the detail. We have about 100 indicators that sit round and about homelessness, and to include all of those in such a high-level report, I think would, you know, be fairly complex and take up, you know, quite a lot of space uh, or, or quite a lot of detail that we would have. Um, so, yeah, in many instances, we've prevented homelessness. And also, in many instances, the household's homelessness was resolved before it actually occurred. Okay, but um, nevertheless, uh, there are increasing, um, it's an increasing problem in Perth and Kinross. And whilst I understand the reasons for providing summary reports, et cetera, et cetera, what I'm far more concerned about is understanding why this is happening. Are you able to? comment on the main reasons that you find for increasing levels of homelessness? Yeah, well, and what I would add is that, you know, we, we undertake, we, we're part of uh, housing options, uh, benchmarking groups. Uh, the team meet regularly with other local authorities uh, across Tayside and also at a national level. Uh, we're, you know, we have, like, other local authorities nationally experienced an increase in homelessness. And this trend isn't just familiar to Perth and Kinross, it is uh, a national picture. Uh, the main reasons that we people present to us as homeless are they're asked to leave 
uh, their current accommodation, relationship breakdown is a very common reason, and action by uh, landlords uh, in terms of termination of the tenancy. So those are our main reasons for homelessness, and there's a range of preventative work and measures that we undertake. Uh, prevention, obviously, is the main thing that we want to do, and we undertake a wide range of activity and prevention measures uh, to try and prevent homelessness occurring. Uh, we work very closely within the schools uh, to raise awareness about housing and homelessness. Um, we work very, very closely uh, with our uh, community care and social work colleagues. Uh, we undertake family mediation if young persons are asked to leave the family home. There's a range of actions that we take in terms of domestic abuse and relationship breakdown as well. So we do a, a huge amount of work in terms of preventative work. Uh, and you'll see through the report and certainly through the local housing strategy uh, that through our home first approach, uh, we've been um, delivering some very positive outcomes in respect of homelessness. Councillor Fee. Yes, thank you. Just for clarification, Claire, would the explanation given uh, to reduce the figure from 8 to 9 in year 17-18, would that explanation be uh, relevant to the previous two years? Uh, so reducing the, the figures for the previous two years. Sorry, could you ask that question again? Well, uh, you gave an explanation that the figure of 829 wasn't in fact correct because uh, for reasons given, uh, the figure was reduced and not as many as 123 required uh, were deemed homeless. Would that explanation have been true for the previous two years, reducing their figures similarly. Yeah, that, I mean, the, the, the explanation there. So the, the 829, those were the number of households that we did assess as being homeless. The, the definition of homelessness is very right. wide reaching. And we make that decision within 28 days. We often make it before that of the person presenting to us as homeless. And then from there, yeah. Homelessness often doesn't happen, say, for a month after yeah. or a couple of months after, and then from okay. there, homelessness is often resolved. But yes, that would have been the case in terms of the, the figures for the previous year. The same sort of thing. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. But the changes to the recording of the number of presentations was it, was it only came in when? The, the changes to the recording of the, the presentations, you'll see that that was from 1617 to 1718. Councillor McCall. Thank you, Convener. Uh, I first of all want to say thank you for this report. I think it's quite comprehensive and very um, complete. However, I have a few questions on the tables that are presented on page 74, 78 and 81, and mainly around the target setting from next year and beyond. They seem to plateau almost universally in terms of all the measures, and I'm just curious as to know why that would be. Um, thank you, Councillor McCall, for the question. As Claire, you know, sort of indicated earlier, that, you know, and as I have said, this is our first um, business management and improvement plan. Um, you know, sort of in the process that we went through to build it, you know, sort of was very much a very inclusive, you know, sort of process. At the point where we wanted to set and needed to set the targets, you know, sort of then that was th that was where we were going as a next step, you know, sort of. But we were also conscious that some of these targets are already taken from the corporate and community plan, um, you know, sort of, so that they are already set and approved by the council. But for other ones, until we know, as I, as I said in my introduction, what the financial challenges are, you know, sort of going forward, then we want to do an assessment to make sure that, you know, sort of in our next DMIP and annual performance report that these targets are more suitable. So some of them may plateau. I think that we may have to consider that some of the targets may have to reduce because, you know, sort of we will not have necessarily the resources, um, you know, sort of, so it's, allow, it's to, to allow us a proper and full consideration of that going forward. And I think you know, for things like, for example, this percentage of allocations to, to homeless households, which is steady at, at, at 50 percent, you know, at that level of percentage and through vacancy chain management, we will still be able to uh, house people who are made homeless um, rapidly. Um, but because we're getting greater number of moves within the, within the stock um, through the vacancy chains, um, the percentage of, of, of homeless um, applications would appear to drop, whereas the number uh, won't. 
I'll wait to see what comes out later then. I'm, I'm not quite sure I, I totally agree with that response in terms of future look ahead. Um, the only other comment I would make in terms of the structure of the report is on page 91 in terms of the risk profile. Um, I think it would be helpful if, there was, if it was actually ragged because that's a visualisation that most people would understand and accept. Yep. And again, thank you for the question. You know, sort of, and again, I think that this is just part of the work in progress. I mean, the report identifies that what we are trying to do is, you know, sort of create a very, um, you know, sort of cohesive single service. Um, and in doing that, with all the all the day-to-day -day activity and drawing together the new service, then you know, sort of, there are some elements of where we still need to do some work, and risk is one of those. So that you know, sort of, this is that these are the high-level risks for the whole service. There are other risks, and then the next time we see it, it will be ragged. And that will hopefully come through the six monthly annual performance report. Okay, are there any other questions, or can we agree to approve the report? Thank you very much. Uh, paper seven is the education and children services uh, BMIP in relation to criminal justice services. Um, two high level actions of the ECS BMIP are relevant to this committee regarding uh, effective uh, interventions to prevent and reduce the risk of offending behavior. Uh, and secondly, to deliver the community justice outcomes assigned to Perth and Kinross uh, criminal justice social work services as set out in the community justice improvement plan. Um, I apologize uh, to members for the scant content of the report uh, which represents these two improvement actions in somewhat uh, uh, glorious or inglorious uh, isolation. Um, however, I think it would have been um, unfair to members of the committee to ask you to wade through uh, the whole BMIP um, just to look at the, these two uh, indicators. Um, I have asked uh, Nicola Rogerson to provide a bit more context to the committee um, on the reviews and the community justice uh, outcome improvement plan, which may be of benefit to, to us in looking at these uh, indicators. Uh, Nicola? Is that better? Excellent. <laughs> okay, thank you, convener. Uh, responsibility for criminal justice social work services transferred from housing and community safety to education and children's services on the 1st of April uh, 2018, ensuring that the statutory social work functions were aligned to the chief social work officer. And I think that's outlined in the covering report. The Community Justice Outcome Improvement Plan, which is a three-year plan from April 2017 to March 2020, it's overseen by the Community Justice Partnership, and this already sets out detailed improvement actions for criminal justice social work, along with all relevant statutory partners, such as the Scottish Prison Service, which I think is mentioned there. The BMIP contains high-level actions, which, with, which will be sorry, important for the service over the next year. I'm also pleased to confirm that a joint bid with Dundee City Council for Scottish Government funding to deliver the Caledonian System for Domestic Violence Group Work has been successful. We intend to be in a position to begin the implementation from October 2018. Although the BMIP contains high-level actions, many more areas for improvement will be taken forward, such as a review of our links with youth justice and an evaluation of our one-stop women's learning service, which is our service for female offenders. These reviews will assess the extent to which the needs of service users are met and to determine options for our future operating model. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks very much for that. Do we have any questions to Nicola? No. Can we agree to approve the report? Thank you. Uh, which takes us to paper eight and the annual update on the local housing strategy. Uh, I am particularly pleased to present such a positive update to the committee. Uh, highlights and achievements included in the update uh, include exceeding our targets for the delivery of uh, housing completions covering all builds uh, with 180 new affordable homes uh, built against a target of 150. 
uh, with 161 of those for uh, social rent, uh, all of which comply with the house, housing for varying needs standard uh, and 29 uh, new shared equity houses. Uh, the open market uh, house builds exceeded target by five at 395. Um, it's also good to see that the hard work that goes into the strategic housing investment plan paying off uh, and also worth mentioning that our drawdowns uh, of affordable housing funding from the Scottish Government um, exceeded allocations with 17 million claimed against uh, an allocation of 15 uh, million pounds. Uh, an additional uh, 146 former empty homes uh, were added to the effective housing supply uh, being brought back into use for uh, council nominated applicants. Uh, the report also highlights the success of our Home First Rapid Rehousing Programme, which has achieved a massive improvement in outcomes uh, for people made homeless in Perth and Kinross, dramatically uh, reducing time spent waiting for uh, permanent accommodation, uh, time spent in temporary accommodation, and the numbers of people uh, waiting for settled accommodation. Um, I make no apology for repeating uh, that the Homes First transformation was hailed as the best example uh, of a systems change approach to moving the dial on homelessness uh, uh, by the Homelessness and Rough Sleeping uh, Action Group. Uh, and again, I uh, wish to record my thanks to Claire Miller and her team for their efforts. Uh, they have now incidentally stopped acceding to the clamour of requests uh, for uh, uh, our model and implementation plan from a host of councils across Scotland uh, and are now planning a one-off and final training conference for other authorities uh, before fully concentrating on the next stage of transformation and improvement of homelessness and housing services here in Perth and Kinross. Our approach to special housing need has been enhanced through better planning and research of localist, local specialist housing needs and factoring that into our development plans. Uh, in the course of last year, 1,800 adaptations were carried out uh, to enable people to live as independently and for longer in their own homes. Uh, we were successful in bidding for £1.3 million worth of home energy area-based uh, efficiency schemes money, heaps abs, uh, as they call it, uh, and for £1.4 million worth of warm homes funny, uh, money, money even, not funny money, real money. Uh, uh, in conjunction with Scottish and Southern uh, Energy and uh, Maury Council. Uh, Scottish and Southern uh, Energy have praised the work of this council and its record of delivery to improve insulation and reduce energy bills and consumption uh, across uh, uh, all tenures, both private and council houses, uh, and acknowledge that being in partnership uh, with us increases the chance of successful bids, in this case with Murray Council. Um, the 1.4 million will enable, amongst other things, um, 350 houses in North Muirton uh, to be connected to the gas network and enjoy cheaper energy and reduce carbon consumption, as well as making inroads into fuel poverty in our community. Um, it's very heartening to see that the final stage of our Muirton House Regeneration Programme uh, is on schedule to be completed in December of this year. Um, this programme commenced at almost the same time as I was uh, first elected some 15 years ago uh, with the demolition, demolition uh, of houses in an area of severe deprivation of largely monolithic council house tenements suffering uh, from stigma and low demand. Uh, the transformation has spanned uh, the terms of four housing conveners and five directors of housing uh, and the area now includes a mixture of designs and house types, uh, a variety of social tenures being uh, social rented shared equity, some mid-market rented properties uh, and delivered through multiple landlords and private ownerships. Uh, we are committed to delivering affordable homes for rent and ensuring that rents remain affordable. Uh, an affordability model was constructed to ensure that our rents were based on local incomes and our rents remain the ninth lowest in the country while still delivering on an ambitious new build and strategic housing investment programme to properly maintain uh, and improve our stock. Uh, I commend the report to you and I'm happy to uh, open for any questions. Councillor McEwen. Yeah, I'll, I'll, you know, this is a very good report and obviously highlights how good and how well run a housing department we actually have. One thing the report doesn't go into maybe the detail of, but maybe I can get clarity on, is actually the fitting of solar panels to our housing stock, whether that's retrofitting or whether we're going to create a standard going forward where all new social housing actually is fitted with solar panels. 
Okay, I think certainly it, it has been retrofitting in the in, in the past, and particularly to to properties that were either hard to heat or were were, were off the uh, off the the, the, the electricity sorry off the gas grid, you know, um, and therefore uh, we were sort of making efforts to provide um, you know a, a, a affordable energy in in, in those homes. Um, I don't think our forward plans um, include. Uh, provision of um, solar panels. I think that's largely because uh, the insulation standards of the houses are so good that um, it doesn't would, wouldn't provide a, a kind of economic benefit. But I can uh, ask the, uh, the, 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 the the head of housing to comment on that. Yeah, what what I would say is, in terms of the overall capital programme, we're actually in the process of pulling together a much more detailed elected member briefing in terms of the capital programme, what's been delivered today, and what the plans are on a locality basis going forward. June, I'm not sure if June's able to answer specifically uh, the question in terms of what's in the plan for solar, solar panels. Yes, thank you, convener, councillors. Um, last year, during 1718, we actually fitted 75. Uh, properties with solar PV panels and we've got a similar number planned for this year going forward. And were those retrofits or were those for These were retrofits, not our new build, no. As um, the convener has said, our new build uh, standard is higher in terms of energy efficiency so we won't be fitting them to new build, all retrofit. I understand that the new build heating uh, isn't such a great issue to then go with the more efficient energy from solar panels, but surely uh, patient uh, people who live in our accommodation, the actual impact on their income and expenditure and the stimulation of our economy from them having that extra money because they're not having to pay for their electricity for any use, never mind heating, could have an advantage to our residents and to our economy as a whole. I, I think it, it, it may well do, Tom, but I think it's a, a question of priorities and should our you know, efforts be uh, concentrated on, on that small segment of new people getting um, highly energy efficient new homes or should it be concentrated um, on, on those who are, who are uh, suffering uh, you know, and, and enduring um, fuel poverty at, at present? You know, and I think the Warms Homes money uh, is, 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 is being you know, um, targeted specifically at people who are, who are, who are facing unaffordable energy bills at the, at, at, at the moment and the solar panel retrofits that we do do are again for, for, for people experiencing uh, high energy costs in their in their in their home. So, are there any other questions? Any comments on the report? Thank you, Tom. Can we agree it? Thank you. Uh, the vice convener, I think, will take uh, paper nine on the community payback orders. Thank you, convener. Um, this report is an update to the committee on the operation of community payback orders or CPOs in Perth and Kinross, which during the period of the report was managed by the former Housing and Community Safety Service. The report itself concentrates on the work of the unpaid work team and public protection team. CPOs were introduced by the Criminal Justice and Licensing Scotland Act in 2010 as a presumption against prison sentences of three months or less and replaced the number of community disposals, disposals available to the courts that is, probation, community service, and supervised attendance orders. CPO is a generic term covering a range of disposal options of which unpaid work is one. There is a duty placed upon local authorities to submit an annual report to Scottish Ministers via Community Justice Scotland, and attached to this paper as Appendix 1 is the 2016-27 report that has been submitted. During 2016-17, there were 411 unpaid work requirements completed which equated to 48,700 unpaid work hours. The report highlights the varied work undertaken from large collaborative, collaborative projects with other agencies and services to assisting small community groups. Examples of the type of work include chewing gum removal, litter picking, and garden clearance, all visible benefits to the public. During the period, 68% of offenders were seen within one day of their order being imposed and 65% had met their social worker or completed their work induction within five days. And 85% had started their work placement within three weeks. The report also details the various projects undertaken, the responses from some beneficiaries of the CPOs and how it has, hel has helped them 
and comments from those who have had CPOs imposed upon them. Overall, it reflects a successful program over the period. It also details other CPO requirements apart from unpaid work relating to those offending, where offending is driven by drug, alcohol, or mental health issues. Importantly, evidence shows CPOs are a greater success in avoiding reoffending than short custodial sen sentences. It is this factor which is of further importance as there are proposed legal changes for CPOs to be used as a presumption against prison sentences of 12 months or less. Unless conveners have any other comments or we've got people that can here open it up for questions to officers. If there's any. No questions? Then can we move the paper? is the uh, Make a Stand Domestic abu Abuse Pledge. Um, as we saw in the police report, the number of domestic abuse incidents reported to the uh, police last year totaled uh, 1,142. Uh, for the first quarter of this year, domestic abuse reports are running at uh, 100 per month. Um, last year in Perth and Kinross, uh, 80 homeless presentations were from households experiencing domestic abuse. Um, these figures mean that the lives of hundreds of, of people, family members of all ages and genders, are blighted by the perpetrators of uh, domestic abuse. Um, all of us, I'm sure, uh, will agree that that isn't right and that we should respond visibly and effectively to tackle domestic abuse uh, to safeguard the rights of people to live safely in their homes. Um, we want to do everything we can to tackle domestic abuse and to support uh, any members of our community, our customers or staff who may be experiencing it. Um, and that is why I want this committee to send a clear signal that we are making a stand and working to ensure that all of our customers and staff know how to seek advice and help if they're affected by uh, domestic abuse. By signing up to the Make a Stand pledge, which has been devised by Women's Aid and backed by the Chartered Institute uh, of Housing for Scotland, focusing on the issues of over 58,000 people um, across Scotland experiencing domestic abuse last year, and that in all homicides uh, recorded in the last 10 years, just over half uh, of the female's victims aged between 16 and 70 years uh, were killed by their partner or, or ex-partner. We believe that the housing sector can do more to protect those women and by signing the pledge we can provide local leadership. Section 3 of the report details the four commitments that the Council must make and fulfil in honouring the Make a Stand pledge. It highlights that we already recognise domestic abuse as a strategic needs priority group in our housing allocations policy, which we share with Caledonia and Hillcrest Housing. Our protocol and joint working agreement with Perthshire Women's Aid and our partnership working uh, with the CEDAR project, which members of this committee will know provides multi-agency support for children and young people aged between 4 and 16 and their mothers with the key aim of helping mothers to understand the impact of domestic abuse upon children and to support their children in recovery. The Council website has a page dedicated to domestic abuse. We hold weekly housing advice surgeries at Perthshire Women's Aid and hold regular joint team meetings with them too. It has, as we heard earlier, just been announced that Perth and Kinross Council were successful in a joint bid with Dundee Council in securing uh, £666,000 of support from the Scottish Government to support the implementation of the Caledonian system uh, which will be able to impose a requirement to take part in a structured programme as an alternative to custodial, custodial sentences for adult males with a conviction related to domestic abuse. The Caledonian system is an integrated approach to address men's domestic abuse and to improve the lives of women, children and men. It does this by working with men convicted of domestic abuse related offences on a programme to reduce their reoffending while offering integrated support to women and children and will enhance the support that we can provide locally in furtherance of the, of the pledge. By agreeing to sign the pledge today, we will become the second local authority in Scotland to formally support the campaign and make a stand, and I commend the recommendations of the report to you. Are there any questions or comments? Tom. Obviously, I fully support this paper and will approve it. The question I do have, though, is I know that through the housing revenue account discussion we've had, where we have blocks of shared occupancy with private uh, for landlords, that sometimes we can't install new security doors, etc., etc., and obviously that plays into this aspect where 
we could have a tenant who still has to live reasonably within the same locality as uh, an abusing partner. And although the housing may separate them into different properties, if there's not that security within the access to the building because we cannot get agreement from private landlords to do that, does this give us any further sort of strength of our arm to actually make those changes? Okay, um, I think we'll ask uh, June McCall whether uh, the uh, introduction of the tenancy management scheme is, is assisting uh, the delivery of um, controlled door entry uh, systems in the circumstances um, that you described. But you know, obviously, there will be security measures that can be taken on the actual uh, front door of the of, of the flat. But June, can you comment on the? communal door entry systems? Um, yes, we uh, members of my team work very, very hard in terms of the tenement management scheme. Uh, we have between six and 700 tenement management schemes current at any given point in time. Um, so it's a very um, onerous administration process to go through. We repeatedly go back to blocks where there's multi-tenure, uh, particular difficulties tend to be absent landlords who themselves are not actually living in the block, and we're repeatedly following them them up all the time to try and encourage participation and get secure door entries in. Uh, for 17-18, we actually had 14 blocks that we listed as exemptions under um, our ARC return, and those were all relating to secure door entries. So that gives an idea of the number of blocks that we're still following up in terms of TMSs for that particular element. First of all, I think this is fantastic, and we hope we all endorse it completely. My question was somewhat related. It's to do with other social landlords um, in Perth and Kinross, and whether or not there would be any move to ha have them also sign up to the pledge in terms of their properties and access. It's very related to what John said. Yeah, I, th I think if we can demonstrate um, our own leadership uh, w w within that, then the next step would be to um, approach uh, our, our um, local um, social landlord partners uh, and see whether they're willing to, uh, to to do so. There are um, already um, registered social landlords signed up to the, uh, the campaign, and it's something I'm perfectly happy to follow up on. Excellent, thank you. And thank you very much for your support. Okay. Are there any other comments? Can we agree the paper? Thank you. Our um, final item on today's agenda is the uh, Gypsy Traveller Strategy for 2018 to uh, 2021. Uh, members will recall that our last meeting received an update on the implementation uh, of the previous Gypsy Traveller Strategy uh, and agreed that the new strategy for 2018 to 21 would be brought forward uh, to this committee meeting. Um, the new strategy has been developed with input from partners uh, at a Gypsy Traveller working group with third sector engagement and consultation with the Gypsy Traveller communities facilitated through outreach surgeries, uh, direct mail and online uh, methods. Uh, Gypsy Travellers have travelled throughout Perth and Kinross for centuries and the Scottish Government recognises Gypsy Travellers as an ethnic group requiring the same levels of protection against discrimination and abuse in common with any other uh, minority ethnic community in Scotland, uh, but also as a community who are particularly discriminated against and marginalised. The strategy contains five key themes which are consistent with the key themes of the previous strategy. Uh, site provision, uh, where we will revise our policy related to uh, managing temporary encampments and we'll consider a managed stopping process within that. Um, towards that end, I'll be visiting uh, Leeds City Council as part of a COSLA delegation next month uh, to find out how their sector leading work on the uh, managed stopping approach has developed uh, or was developed and, and implemented. The second key theme is around improving access to uh, services and advice uh, on employment and health. Uh, we'll continue to work with PCAVs, Bridging the Gap Project, uh, MECOP, the Multi-Ethnic Carers of Older Peoples Project, uh, and with parents and pupils to encourage uh, continuing education uh, uh, within the community. Uh, on anti-discrimination, we will continue to deliver staff training on gypsy traveller cultural awareness raising uh, and out-of-sight training through show races and the red card programmes in schools. 
Uh, I was very sad to miss the civic reception uh, for show races and the red card, uh, which was held to recognise 10 years of service and engagement within our community by the uh, show races and the red card education workers, uh, former footballers working from St Johnson's McDermott Park and in schools uh, to tackle bullying and racism. Uh, we'll continue to address operational issues at Double Dykes and Bobbin Mill. Um, it is worth noting that we had a ministerial uh, visit to Double Dykes only yesterday. The visit by the new Minister for Equalities and Older People, uh, Christina McKelvey, stemmed from a meeting between civil servants, uh, MECOP and Double Dykes residents just a few months ago, uh, which informed the newly established Gypsy Traveller uh, Women Voices uh, project. The final theme is community engagement and empowerment. We will continue to support the Gypsy Traveller community to host the annual uh, Wellbeing Mila uh, and in partnership with MECOP and PCABs, bridging the gap to provide outreach surgeries uh, and to take forward the Rajport project in Pitlochry with its particular focus on cultural heritage, traditional art and history. Uh, appendices to the strategy contain a list of who does what and how to contact them and guidance to a wide range of supports. Um, and uh, happy to commend the paper to members of the committee. Are there any questions? Any comments on the paper? Can we agree the report? Thank you. And thank you very much for your uh, attendance and participation today. <laughs>